Okay, we're just going to recap. We had some complicated things that we talked about um, on Tuesday. And in a way, quantum mechanics is the key to understanding magical thinking in the 20th and 21st century. So we're actually going to take some time unraveling exactly what quantum weirdness is so that you can see the physical parameters, the scientific description of reality that makes all of these extraordinary extrapolations, the claims made by the secret, seem, well, plausible. And it's all in the fact that what happens on a subatomic level breaks all the rules. It's so funky and bizarre that it might as well be a magical universe for all the stuff that's going on um, down there in the interior of the atom. So let's just recap a little bit about what this quantum mechanics is. Well, we know we have Bohr with his breakthrough interpretation of the electron atom. And what's important here is that Bohr interprets that bizarre, um, the bizarre uh, interpretation of energy as packets, little quanta of energy, so that energy actually has this weird dual nature. Sometimes it's a wave, and sometimes it's a photon particle. And he interprets this within the scheme of an electron, of an electron atom, and he tells us that when an, an electron is in an orbit around the proton, and when an electron actually absorbs, grabs one of these little quanta of energy, one of these little packets of electromagnetic energy, that is when the electron jumps to a higher state. So he figures out that the electron actually is only stable within certain or, uh, uh, orbits of certain energy. And just let's stop for a second and talk about quantum weirdness number one. I just said that the electron leaps from one orbital level to another orbital level. Now, this is casually described as what happens when an electron absorbs too much energy so it simply can't stay in the initial orbit that it was in. It either has to go up one level or it has to drop down a level depending on whether that electron gained or lost this little packet of energy. But think about it. It just leapt from one orbit to another. That means it was in one quantum state, in one orbital state. It winked out of existence and reappeared in another orbit. It's as if I were traveling 60 miles an hour, and suddenly I was traveling 80 miles an hour. But I didn't, go between, I didn't travel 61 through 79 miles an hour. It's as if I were standing here, and then I appeared at the end of the classroom, at the very back wall, without you seeing me walk between these two points. We live in a contiguous, continuous universe. If you want to get from A to C, you got to go through B. And that was what was so cool about Bewitched, right? She would snap her fingers and wiggle her nose, and she would get from point A to point C in an instant. So what she was doing was clearly a magical form of transportation because uh, Darren would have to walk from point A to C. Now we have electrons behaving in this bizarre way that they simply leap from one state of energy to another state of energy without transiting between the other energy levels in between. So let's give another example. Say I want to go, I frequently am saying, to Palm Springs, and we know it's 90 miles away. Well, I'm traveling, say, 50 miles an hour, and it's just taking me forever to get there. Um, I finally get, you know, about halfway after traveling an hour, and then I decide I want to increase my speed. But the next level of my speedometer forces me to go 100 miles an hour, and suddenly I'm on the other side of Palm Springs. I went from being halfway to Palm Springs 
to over shooting Palm Springs. And I'm nowhere in between. The amount of energy that was allowable is discrete. The kind of um, increments, I mean, I guess this is the whole point. Energy does not travel in a continuum. Energy has to build in these quantum, these uh, discrete units. So the world, even though it looks like flowy, smooth, and continuous, is actually quantized. In order to get from one state to another state, you actually have to leap there. Now, this makes absolutely no sense on a macroscopic level, but this is what is going on. So we're going to hold on to that idea of a quantum leap and how truly weird that is. And that's our first weird idea about quantum reality, okay? Because it's just going to get so much weirder that I shouldn't have even assigned the secret to you for next week because you're going to listen to it and believe it after this lecture. So there's a couple of flies in the ointment. People are looking at Bohr's interpretation of the electron. And the thing is, in his stable orbits of the circular orbits, the electron wouldn't actually be stable. So it couldn't be explained in that simple orbital pathway, the way the planets go around the sun. But it could be explained as a regular mechanical wave. So we have de Broglie come up with this mathematical wave pattern to describe the behavior of an electron as it's going around in orbit. Now, there's different ways of interpreting this of different levels of weirdness. And we're going to find out that we have to descend into the most ultimately weird variety in order to understand um, what quantum physics is truly modeling. At first, this is a simple statement. You know, we've already proven that these little quantastic energy um, packets come as photons. A photon is a particle. But we also know that they have specific wavelengths associated with them. And we know from multiple exper experiments, and this was in the early 20th century, they caught a photon behaving both as a wave and as a particle. They had to accept that. So what de Broglie is saying is that, look, you know what's true for energy? That's true for mass, just the way energy has a particle wave duality. Mass has a particle wave duality. But let's think about what he's saying. There's a wave associated with this moving particle. OK. And wave-particle duality is fundamental to nature. So we know all the particles are going to have this. But that still isn't really telling us what the wave is. So let's just throw out a couple of intuitive questions. Well, you know when you see an ocean wave? That's easy. What is the wave? Well, it's kind of the water molecules. And it's also the ocean waving. So this wave structure is actually a thing. Well, we know that. According to um, this, these interpretations, you're actually looking at the energy traveling through a vacuum. We're not dealing with a wave in water. We're dealing with an electromagnetic wave in space, in nothing. So what is waving? What is it? So there is a sort of calming way to look at this. And you can say, well, you know what? It's an information wave. It is a pilot wave. It's a wave that is. Con containing the movement of the particle as it moves in space, so it is consistent with this particular wave pattern. Information wave, pilot wave, nothing particularly undeterministic about that. We can't see it, we can't touch it, we can't taste it. We might think, that's really weird. Where did the wave get this information about itself? So that's plenty quantum weird, but in a way, de Broglie's interpretation of the wave as a pilot wave was an attempt to offer a sort of deterministic view that the wave behaves in this specific way. And there's lots of people, and we talked about this, teasing out. They love this uh, de Broglie wave model because it did make the electron orbit stable, although you could punch in certain variables for the position and the momentum along de Broglie's wave. And you would get some crazy answers. Sort of you choose one factor for momentum, and suddenly you can have an infinite spectrum of behavior position for position, even, say, way outside the galaxy. 
It just was crazy mathematically, but it was stable. But it did get people to wonder exactly what is this information wave. Well, again, a simple way, and we're going to approach things, go move from the sort of simple and intuitive to the complex, is uncertainty. Now, uncertainty at first means you and I are limited. We cannot be certain. Because in order, just because of the complexity of the universe, let's say we're looking for the momentum versus the position. We know that momentum is the frequency of the particle, and you can only actually track its progress or track its velocity through space if you know how long it took it to get from point A to point B. You want to find the momentum of something, that requires it traveling a, a certain distance. Either you can look at that as going from position A to position B, or you can look at that as traveling for a certain interval of time. You'll see this question posed both as you can't know the momentum and position of the particle, or you can't know the energy of the particle and the exact time um, that the part of, uh, that of in, you can't have a very specific interval of time in, if you also have a specific energy. So just to make that clear, that just means due to the nature of our limitations, once we grab the particle, we might know where it is, but how can we know the speed? If judging from the speed, we don't need to know how long it took this particle, which is now at B, how long it was traveling from A. Shucks, we can't know. It doesn't mean there wasn't a specific speed that got it to, to uh, that it wasn't traveling a specific speed or velocity. It just means we can't know it. So that's the sort of happy-go-lucky uncertainty. It just means we can't know because we're limited. And he put this many different ways. Sometimes you would look at it as if you're trying to measure a system and you have to actually interject a certain amount of energy, right? We can't see an electron. We've got to like bounce some photons off of it to try to find it. Well, we disrupted the system because we had to bring our equipment and our equipment distorts the values of the system. So there's lots of ways we're going to find this idea of uncertainty is still not fully comprehended. Some people are going to say just that. It's about our limitations and our, our, our instrumentation, our measurements. But there is a deeper, more cunning, more subtle, more disturbing way of looking at this information wave. If we look at the information wave that de Broglie drew, it was in a way a, a single deterministic pathway, we just weren't smart enough to know what it was because we can never know the momentum and the position enough to actually graph the wave. But theoretically, it should be. Now, um, you get Heisenberg and Born and other physicists teasing away at this issue, and they come up with an even deeper, more problematic interpretation. No, you know what? It's actually in determinacy. The reason that we simply cannot know both the momentum and the position is that they can never, they are never actually any one single thing. It's an indeterminate universe. Well, let's, let's put this, this is kind of a complicated idea. So we have to take a second to think about it. And, I, and Norton can't snore over my thinking. It'll certainly disrupt this explanation. Now, if system, we're talking about getting from A, A to B. If I can never really know the exact coordinates for at position A, that's momentum of the particle and the position, then I can never know what the, what the coordinates are going to be at position B. Because in order to calculate position B with any certainty, wouldn't I first need to know how to calculate position A? So there's this deep sense that we can't really know anything about this um, wave-particle duality. So the best we can do is look at it as probabilistic. And it's going to actually get worse than this. So this is kind of the easy part. Um, so, so now we're looking at the information wave, and we're saying, you know what? I think that wave is actually a probability wave. If there's a certain energy state 
in a given orbital pathway on an elect in an, um, as an electron moves around a proton, we know that it has to be at a given energy state. If it absorbs more energy, it's going to another level, either up or down. But at a certain uh, orbital level, it has a given energy state. But there's an infinite way, different wavelengths, different amplitudes, different momentums of different mass. There's an infinite way that the particle can technically stay within the parameters of that energy state. So there's not one single informational pathway, right? All the particle has to do is stay in that orbit, stay within that energy state. And quite frankly, it can do so not along one pathway, one frequency, but along infinite frequencies. Infinite, so infinite um, ways of interpreting the position and pathway of the electron and still allowing it to stay in a certain energy state. So now I've got up in the corner, really, Look, isn't that so much messier than that nice little squiggly line that de Broglie drew? This is like the electron cloud. This is really what's going on inside that atom. Electrons could be here, 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 here. And all of that is sort of collated into a cloud of orbital pathways. And when you see something like this, this isn't one wave. This is if you collapsed the infinity of possible frequencies that that wave could be traveling at and still stay within the requisite energy system. If you collapse all of those potential pathways, you'll get probabilities of it's most likely to be here. It's least likely to be here. Does this describe one wave? No. This describes um, a broad, broad spectrum of possible um, of possible waves and pathways. And quite frankly, and we have to think about this before we, because this is an important point. Um, look, oh, Norton. OK, just he's not allowed to go beyond that area. And no naughtiness this time between you two. Um, uh, if in order to get to B, this is about determinism, OK? So let's say my goal is to arrive at B. In classical mechanics, we could say there's one way to do it. You have to be at a specific position and momentum, specific variables. A will correlate to outcome B. But now I'm all quantum. Now I know I can arrive at B along a whole number of pathways. And this is where it gets weird. If I can arrive along a whole number of pathways to get to B, that means to really describe this reality, describing just one of those pathways would be a lie. If you really want to describe this reality, you'll have to be honest that getting from A to B is a gazillion pathways. And that is the true nature of the electron. The, net, the, the pathway of the electron is not determined. To understand the identity of that electron, you don't need to limit it to a specific position or momentum. A whole spectrum of options are open to that electron. If you really want to understand the nature of that electron, you can't be just re responsible for the part of it that's a particle. The part of it where you go, there you are. You have to be responsible for the part of it which was there you could have been, right? Because it's not just one thing or the other. So I've written this indeterminacy as the paired variables which describe a particle's momentum, m, and position, p. They're not causally correlated in a one-to-one -one manner. A does not necessarily produce b. They're related to each other, but there's a whole uh, range of ways in which a can, can uh, interact with the system to get you to be. It's not just one pathway. If the state of the electrons, um, position and momentum at position A do not fully determine its position when the particle is at B, then technically, I've already said this and just explaining what's on the slide, anything goes. There's multiple pathways and they're all equally valid. And this is the whole point of indeterminacy. It's not a particle acting out the pattern of a wave. 
because that's just not that hard to understand. Taking a particle and saying, this particle is going to move like this, is just not that hard to understand. But taking a particle and say, this particle is this, moving along this particular frequency, but guess what? It's also all the other pathways you didn't see it take. And those are all integral to its unobserved nature. And then you ask, as many of these Copenhagen people were doing, well, why did that electron decide to take that particular pathway between A and B, even though there were so many ways to go? Oh, you interfered with the system by observing it. And when you observed that system, it collapsed into one of its options. It manifested it as its particle identity. And the rest of its wave aspect, remember a wave occupies a whole range of areas through space, is nullified. Or rather, not nullified, it's just submerged. How are we supposed to interpret this? Well, people were on to the fact that this was just crazy talk. And they had a huge problem with something being one thing and everything at the same time with something being a wave and a particle at the same time. And one of the most famous thought experiments, which I'm sure you've already heard of, is Schrodinger, who in the 1930s is just looking over this whole indeterminacy thing, this uncertainty thing, and he's saying, well, that just sounds nutty. And I can, uh, this is uh, Schrodinger, so we're going to quote his own sort of complaint. One can even set up a quite ridiculous case. A cat is penned up in a steel chamber along with the following device. We'll give him a Geiger counter. There's a little bit of radioactivity substance in it that's so small that in the course of an hour, one of the atoms will probably decay. Maybe it'll decay. Maybe it won't. Um, OK. Um, OK, so we have, we know that there's no set laws, right, within this atom. In the nucleus of this radioactive material, maybe it's going to decay, maybe it won't. There's no hard and fixed rule. So say I strap this Geiger counter, which is going to be triggered by the maybe decay or maybe not decay, and, a, and a, attached to it, the Geiger, is going to be like the little poisonous gas. And then if the, if the proton decays, it hits the, makes the Geiger counter um, hit the hammer and break the, break the glass. And then the cat dies. All right. That was like somewhat lame explanation. But you know, you get the basic idea here. There's the kitty cat. Hold on. I thought that in quantum reality, it's not just the reality we observe. It's all of the realities that were possible within that particular energy state. It's not just the one pathway. It's the multiple pathways. So in a way, in a quantum reality, we have a simultaneous reality where did the proton decay? Did the proton not decay? Nobody's observing the system, so technically, it should be in its multiple states at once, right? Because we're the ones that make it collapse its potentialities and become its the actual specific event. We're the ones that do that. Nobody's watching the cat. Nobody's watching the Geiger counter. So technically, the cat could be in multiple states, both alive and dead. Boom. Watch. You, you open the box, you check out to see what happens. The wave either has to collapse as I've decayed, I've gone to the pathway where I'm decaying, or I'm along the pathway where I'm staying stable, and boom, we've got a cat that actually now is alive or dead in the wake of my observation. Prior to my observation, technically, it was in both states at once. I don't know how much you're believing that. But that's the famous sort of thought experiment. This is the problem as it occurred. OK, so now this is going to be the Copenhagen interpretation. 
It is going to be the interpretation that embraces not the semi-weird, like, oh, it's an information wave. We just don't have enough knowledge of the hidden variables to tell you exactly or follow exactly its pathway and determine the exact nature of that wave. But it is deterministic if only we knew the variables. No, Bohr embraces the radical implications of the theory. There is no hidden variable. It is no, and if there is a variable that's making the electron choose a specific pathway, if there is a variable, it's the act of observation. We are the variable missing from the system that makes the system collapse into an actual event instead of an infinite probability that events will occur. So, and just because we're watching again the system and we're watching the particle collapse and become this actual event, this actual particle that went either to A or went to B, that either went the pathway of decay or went the pathway of stability. Even though we're watching it become one thing or the other thing, this is the freaky duality part. It still has its underlying wave-like nature. And Heisenberg, rather, Bohr in the Copenhagen theory, he does something a little tricky. He says, look, this is quantum reality. There are no hidden variables, but let's be careful here before we get too freaky. Our brains might not be able to understand this, so it just seems really, really counterintuitive and impossible. Let's not limit reality to what our brains can understand. Let's accept the mathematics. Let's not look for other hidden variables. Let's accept that in some way our observation of the system collapses the system into a specific event. But let's also remember that science is not trying to really, really know the absolute ontological truth of something. Science is just predictive. Science is just descriptive. And hey, we love the numbers. The numbers are working for us. So this Copenhagen interpretation still floats in this realm of nuttiness, right, where quantitatively, mathematically, it seems to ascertain this bizarre reality, but scientists hold back and say, this doesn't necessarily map onto anything deeply real. Remember what we learned from science on Tuesday, that science in the 20th century had already said, so much of what we practice is limited by our subjectivity. We evolved in this three-dimensional space using three-dimensional symbols and a language that maps onto this world. We didn't, involve, we didn't evolve in a sub-quantum environment, right? So don't try to make it conform to us and don't start extrapolating all these crazy theories because of this mathematics. It's theoretically true. Let's not say anything about it being realistically true. So Einstein doesn't like that. Because remember, the romantic scientists of the 19th century, and Einstein had a little bit about that. He's like, no, I want science to be able to give us some kind of deeply satisfying understanding of the world. I don't like this world you're giving us, A, because you're, that the way you describe quantum activity and the brain is the what has to step in and collapse events, that's just crazy. There are secret hidden variables that are unaccounted for by quantum mechanics that will show you that God created a perfect watch in his own way, that A actually does always produce and correlate to B, that you don't have this random, bizarre universe where A can lead to B or C or D or E or F or G, and then we have to step in and make the decision for God. God's not throwing the dice and then letting us have to read the dice. That's just crazy. So he's holding out for a more affirmative theory, a more satisfying theory where quantum mechanics resolves all the other hidden issues that can explain causality why that uh, particle behaves the way it does and understand and control 
all the variables, all the hidden variables in the system. Now, that's one of the things Einstein did not like about quant. Where is that dog? OK. Um, now, I'm now going to go into the part where everything I said, we're going to prove, right? So all this freaky stuff we've been saying, and it's all been theoretical, and so therefore kind of abstract, and, and uh, Bohr could say, this is what the theory is. Don't mess with it. But at the same time, in terms of its reality or not, it, it doesn't really matter. It's descriptive. Now, we're going to get into the double slit experiment, both um, Feynman's double slit experiment and Wheeler's double slit experiment. First is just the innocent, happy-go-lucky double slit experiment that we had from like uh, 1802 and that they repeated again with photons in the early 20th century. But if you have a single source for light, something really weird happens. If you send it through two slits, the waves overlap and create an interference pattern of light, dark, light, dark bands, and that even though wave is a particle, and you're at, at, in the early 20th century version of this, they were actually emitting photons, it's behaving like a wave. Done deal. It's proven right here. So in 1802, when they sent a light beam, that was proof that light was a wave. So for the whole 19th century, there was like, no, we did the double slit experiment, light is a wave. Then you had Planck come up with this whole quantum packet thing, they do the experiment again, shooting photons through as particles, and get the same results. So light is now a wave and a particle. Either or, either a wave or a particle, I think, or is it just even crazier? Feynman, the great theoretical um, and experimental physicist of the 20th century, he wants to tease out some of the implications, wants to find an experiment that can kind of push Copenhagen's interpretation to the wall and make it actually, if there's ways to test the really, really crazy implications so that they don't just exist on paper and as predictions, which were all very solid, but can actually be recreated in a laboratory environment. So he comes up with this freaky version of the double split, slit experiment. Now, one thing that's important to realize is that if you pass an electron through a single slit and there's no way interference with you know, other photons, it's just one photon being passed through a single slit, what you get in the back of the screen is a splatter pattern. So as the photons hit the screen, They'll fall in a lot of concentration. There'll be a lot of light and intensity in one area. But it will fall in a sort of probability wave where there'll be some photons off to the side and a little splatter pattern, but um, along a kind of probability wave. So, and then if you actually have the same beam, the same photon source being shot at a screen with two slits open, for whatever reason, they interact now and they're behaving like a wave, and they're overlapping, and they're creating the wave-like, right here it says wave, the wave symbol. All right, they've done that before. This is nothing new. This is what Feynman does. Feynman takes the two slits. The two slits, which up until now, have always produced an interference pattern. He says, what if I put a detector at each slit, maybe a telescope or some kind of detector that's trained on each slit. So there's like an observer on each slit letting the photon know, you're a particle now. I'm watching you. You've got to collapse into a specific particle form. And even though I send out from the same source through now the same two slits that I used when I got an interference pattern, now that I have the little photo detectors on them, these two slits are producing splatter patterns as if the photon was just going through a single slit. So now it's acting like they're two single slits instead of a double slit. 
the interference pattern is totally different. Now, this should strike you as incredibly weird and crazy. Because if you put just, if you put just one of these slits open and you put the photon through, there'd be a lot of light right behind the band. And then if you close that slit and open the other slit, you'd see there'd be a, a lot of light and then black bands around it. So it'd be very, very intensely light when it's acting like one slit. And you'd think, if I open both slits, well, the same thing should actually happen. But what is so weird is, when both slits are open, somehow certain photons cancel out other photons. That things that used to be really light and brightly lit when um, the single, just the single slit was open, now there are patches of dark. How does that happen? This whole idea that it sometimes behaves like a wave and sometimes behaves like a photon involves the most bizarre interference between electrons. They must be telling each other, no, well, in this case it's photons, no, don't land there. Even though you landed there when it was just one slit open, don't land there because then we'll have a really too bright a beam there and that's supposed to be an interference pattern. It's supposed to be dark there. Don't land there. Land over here. I mean, they must be, in a way, communicating with each other, acknowledging that they're in a wave interference pattern and creating the interference. Well, that's a crazy statement. But Wheeler actually kind of proves that it's true. That there's something about that Feynman experiment where the electrons, when they knew they were, when, look how I have to talk about electrons and photons, as if they knew something. You know, this is terribly regressive. Um, somehow, the photon, when it was subject to detection, collapsed into a particle. And when it was not subject to, de to specific detection at each slit, it behaved like a wave. Wheeler takes this and he pushes it a little bit further to actually prove. Um, I'm going to give you this version. There's several versions of this uh, um, experiment. I think this one's a little bit easier to understand. So, he sends a photon out from a single source, and he sends it through a double slit. And say he does that for a while, and he gets his interfering wave pattern. But then he decides to trick the photon. And he sends the photon through the double slit. But then, once the photon passed through the double slit, he uh, sort of um, he tricks the photon and he closes one of the slits. So now the photon, which passed through a double slit, now behaves as if, after the fact, it only passed through a single slit. And he does this over and over again, and sure enough, what kind of pattern does he get? That even though the wave, pa the, the photon passed through a double slit, if you keep closing the, one of the slits after it passes through that, so that in your frame of reference, the way you're interpreting the system, the electron should or photon should behave as a single particle, it does. He proved this in both directions. Sometimes he would send the photon through a single slit and then secretly open the other slit so then the photon would have to be, oh, I just went through a double slit, I better act like a wave and make an interference pattern. So this is, these patterns are the result of photons behaving in distinct ways, right? Taking specific pathways associated with whether they're in a single or a double slit formation. They're choosing which pathways to take based on the assumptions of the observers. I mean, this is a, an experiment that has been done, you know, in different ways, different times, and it keeps coming up with the same crazy um, results. This is the version that was in the reading I gave you, so I won't give you this, but they're the exact, they're basically proving the exact same thing. Now, there was one other feature to this quantum mechanics that um, Einstein picked up on. We know he already did not like the whole observation collapses the system, otherwise all pathways are possible. We know he didn't like that, but he also, had a little thought experiment in 1935. 
And he wrote this very important paper, Einstein Rosen Podolsky, Rosen Podolsky or Einstein Podolsky Rosen, EPR. And it basically says, wait a minute, quantum theorists. You know how certain particles you know, might be paired together so we know that they have a, a matched spin? Say one's spinning up, the other has to be spinning down. Well, what if I observed those two particles? And by the way, we know they have to have opposite spins, but because it's quantum indeterminacy, we don't know which direction the particles are spinning in because they're spinning in both directions at once. But when we watch it, we know, ah, I've collapsed the system. It has to take a specific pathway. It has to behave in a certain way. And now particle B is, going, is spinning negatively. Einstein says, aha, particle B has a negative spin. I know particle A must have a positive spin, but I didn't watch it. And yet here it is, you know, being uh, existing in a along a specific pathway, manifesting as a specific particle with a specific particle identity, and I didn't observe it, so you must be wrong, Copenhagen uh, theorists. And yet, he's really onto something, onto something called non-locality, that the system in which these two particles are joined actually is impacted by observation. And somehow, the, the, the system remains connected and under the sort of mutual influence of the observer, even when these particles are parted. This is Feynman's thought experiment. Feynman's, Feynman suggests that you prove, actually, that once you observe the change in um, direction of a spin of a particle A, particle B will actually assume the opposite directional spin so that the system is complete and consistent according to the expectations of the observer. So he says, let's start with a zero spin particle that's really made up of two constituent particles. One, say, spins up. One, say, spins down. But we don't really know that, remember? They could both spin up, they could both spin down, but they have to be opposite. Then let's send these flying apart, and let's just observe the directional spin of A and force A to either go up or down, because now I'm looking at A, and then let's see if we can't detect what happened over here with particle B. And I think if quantum physics is true, that once we observe the spin of the paired particle, that will actually determine the spin of its partner particle. That the thing that Einstein said was crazy, two particles acting in a non-local way as if they're still entangled, as if they're still linked, is true. Because they did this exact experiment at the laboratory in CERN where they're now doing the Large Hadron Collider. This was a while ago. This was in 1992. But they did this experiment where they took a particle, uh, split it into particles that absolutely, according to the laws of physics, had to have opposite charges. Again, we don't know what those charges are, but they have to be opposite. They sent them hurtling, 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 17 miles apart. They were able to observe that particle A had a positive spin. And without anybody actually going over there and looking at that system over there, if they had some other kind of detector that wasn't the people over here watching, that had somehow been under the influence and had the opposite spin. And no matter how many times you did this, then if you went over here and you observed this, and it would change its spin. If you changed the spin over particle B, say it was negative, and then you turned it to positive, and then you walked your 17 miles and got over back to positive a, uh, particle A, if that was positive, that was negative, and so on and so on. The minute you changed the spin of one particle, its opposing particle, 17 miles away, somehow knew that in order to be consistent with quantum laws of physics, it had to be, uh, take the opposite charge. It's as if they had knowledge of each other. Notice how we keep talking about these weird sentient particles. 
particles that know. The observer expects us to behave as if we're in an overlapping group wave. So if we're going through both, splits, both slits, then we need to let our wave functions overlap. Oh, the observer is treating us as if we're just a single photon using a single wave pathway, so let's just act like a single photon then. And even if they're both going through slits at the same time, as long as both those slits are observed, it's like they agree to each act like photons and stay out of each other's way and not cancel each other's photons out and not overlap in strange, freaky ways. This is all true. Now, now that we've said all this, I mean, what has physics done but created occult causality? Action at a distance. Mind determining the nature of matter. All of these magical ideas that were banished, right, with the Enlightenment, or rather with the scientific revolution. It took so long for science to say, no more occult causality. Remember, this was the project of the um, pre-Socratics. They wanted to find rigorous, regular cause and effect in nature. That this notion of understanding why things happen is so incredibly basic to natural philosophy, to science. And now, all of a sudden, causality is indeterminate. If you're a science and you can't explain why things happen, you've left a giant gap open, right? for other explanations to fill in. And we're going to find that science is now, in a way, physics, the most fertile ground for magical speculation because it lost control, in a way, of causal narratives. Because its causal narratives lend themselves to this kind of co-option. Now, Carl Jung, who we already read about, he's actually writing letters to Wolfgang Pauli, who's one of these um, Copenhagen theorists. He's on board with the whole, you know, got to observe the system to make the wave collapse into a particle. So he already accepts that there's this weird reciprocal nature between mind and matter. And Jung actually takes this physics and he uses it to formulate a new kind of psychology. Now, it's really funny, some of the stuff Jung was saying in your reading. He was saying that at first he thought astrology, there's no way astrology could be true or astrology could be real. Oh, no. He spent too long. Remember, he was a student of Freud's, and Freud was a total materialist. He would have completely been shocked and offended by this. But he said, after I studied the astrological charts of all of these married people, I found that there were these bizarre and significant correlations that people who got married, their astrological charts had, like, conjunctions, favorable conjunctions of the moon. So that, you know, are signs that two people will marry. And, you know, just a across the astrological charts, all of these people, randomly chosen people, all seem to be astrologically foretold that they would marry. Weird. And then he conducts two or three more experiments of the same nature, and he goes, you know, got weaker and weaker. The evidence got weaker and weaker every time we did it, although it was still there. Now, this gets to, it was almost like he was saying, when we expected there to be this powerful causal correlation between astrology and the significant determinants of whether these people would be married or not, we mentally participated in an experiment and in a science where those results were shaped. Our observation of the system, and this correlates to our observation of the system of the photon choosing to go, uh, going through one or two slits, our observation of the system, because of our expectations, shaped the outcome. The first time he reviewed this astrological data, he had these expectations, and indeed, that, those were his findings. But it got fainter and fainter as his expectations diminished. He also, when we talked about the collective unconscious uh, a little bit last week, but remember this idea of this collective unconscious is that we have these archetypal memories, these archetypal images that actually got on board our brains 
not by us reading a specific childhood fairy tale, not by some unremembered experience, but from the experience of our long dead ancestors, that as human beings experienced love and fear and anxiety and symbolized these things to themselves in language and stories and images, all of that collective experience is sort of deposited in our um, in our cells, in our, the physical architecture of our brain. It doesn't just belong to us. It's almost like it's part of our special memory. And so we have access not just to our own memories, but to the memories of our species. We have an individual conscience and a collective conscience. And remember how we romanticized psychology and said, Psychology is trying to bring us into full awareness of the implicate order, the hidden order, the totality, where we only experience a little piece of the truth. Our unconscious is aware of the totality. And that is what people are, are doing when they have visions or, relig or, or religious mystical experiences. They're trying to plumb the depths of this greater unconscious truth. Synchronicity gets even weirder. Synchronicity says, you know all those coincidences? This is one of my favorites, because people, how many times have you heard there's no such thing as coincidence? That's Young's fault. He said it first. So Young says not only our, is our sort of neural architecture and our, our identities and our memories part of the sort of, we're, we're recipients of this collective experience, we are actually, as we speak, as we think, as we feel, participating in the world. We are structuring the world. So when you're experiencing a whole lot of coincidences, things that are very significant to you in a single day, he talks about um, you know, seeing fish all day long. Or there was the, um, the other woman who had a dream of a beetle and then she went into Young's office and a beetle flew through the open window. And then she goes to the museum and it's, you know, beetle week and there's beetles everywhere. He would say her unconscious has focused so much psychic energy on the significance of the beetle. The beetle is trying to, as a symbol, is trying to tell her something of significance. And it is causing a very focused interaction with her frame of reality. So she is almost pulling beetles into the world because she's thinking about the beetles. So she's, in a way, propelling these coincidences and these encounters with her own unknown, unconscious, sort of submerged psychic search for meaning. She's trying to bring out the larger pattern, the larger significance. Because right when coincidences happen, people usually talk about coincidence as it's all leading up to a significant pattern. It's disclosing a sort of significant truth that would otherwise have been unrevealed. If you just looked at the world as random patterns, then this greater truth would be unknown to you. But it's more than just seeing the patterns. It's more than just seeing the synchronicities, you're actually, the implication is, you're creating them. And he talks about manna, which is um, in Polynesian religions, but also variations of it are in most uh, tribal faiths. And this, this notion that everywhere we are sort of the world, instead of the ether, the world is saturated with this vitalistic, supernatural energy, and it is concentrated when you get objects or people or things, it's almost like they're concentrations of mana. It's almost like quantum energy and mass are concentrations within the fabric of the cosmos. This is the same idea, except it's concentrations of the psychic energy. And some people have more psychic energy than others. Therefore, they're able to interact with objects and create events, structure, actual elements of their reality with more power. And other people who don't have a lot of this mana, those are the reasonable, rationalistic people, and they can't create coincidence. So he's saying that there's almost a sort of psychic, subjective factor that people 
bring to this, that people have different degrees of power in regard to manipulating this manna, but that the most manifold of us, I suppose, are interacting with our universe and structuring it even as we speak. So now we've got a completely bizarre turn of events in physics. We've got a classical physics. Actually, does anybody know what time it is? Oh, OK. So I mean, just I guess you see what's happened. You see what's happened to the world. The rational theological model, the one where God doesn't play dice, the one where causality is discrete and it's not random. So a world like that, you can sort of um, extrapolate ethics and principles and you can have a sort of lawful, orderly existence. And you can also rely a lot on science that makes knowledge claims that it can prove or demonstrate. But now we have a science that it doesn't even dare to make these knowledge claims. I mean, most physicists won't even talk to you about this stuff. They're like, well, I don't know. Yeah, I just do the math. So now you have a physics that's almost backed off any hope of understanding the world. And it has left a space for sort of a flood of magical presuppositions, a mystical universe in which we participate, in which we actually return to a kind of magical consciousness and magical potentiality. So I guess, in summation, we're back in the 20th century. How did it turn out? How did the March of Reason, how did the Enlightenment, how did all this progress we've talking about turn out? Right? There's been a sort of bizarre reversal. And this is one of the ways we're going to discover the 20th century is the most magically minded, cr crazy century heretofore. Thank you very much. You're free. It's 43. You weren't lying to me, right? You could have so had me. And now, listen, if, you're going to need to get an escort out of here. You're going to need to get a physical escort. Norton, protect her. Um, OK, so you know, yeah? You want to ask a question? Just one. Yeah. How big a deal is it if I like, don't understand this at all? Well, nobody understands it. <laughs> so it's not a big deal. No, I mean, I think you should be able to. Um, the way the final will work is that um, you'll have your choice of essays. You should be able to, just the way I've put on bullet points here, what the Copenhagen interpretation is. And I've made bullet points of its weirdness, right? right. You know, non-locality, collapsing the electron, like observation as a factor in determining outcomes, multiple pathways. You don't have to understand that, because nobody really does. But if you were going to try to describe the paradigm, you should be able to talk about what the Copenhagen interpretation of the paradigm is. Like what they thought without understanding what that means. They don't even understand it. They're still fighting about what it means today. Okay. So, I mean, how can you possibly really, because all we're looking, we're looking through a glass darkly, right? I mean, when you see an electron and you notice that it's going through, a, because it goes through two slits that have detectors on them, they behave like photons. What can you really know about that? You know, what can you really, you know that detection is somehow playing a role. What is detection? Is it the physical detectors? Is it us reading the detectors? You know, what, what is it? There's just so many questions about what this is. And that's why Copenhagen was, it's as weird as it sounds, but don't try to understand it. We don't have the brains for it. So therefore, let it just be a description of the universe. And then Einstein, the romantic, is like, no, I want to understand. right? And you are wanting to understand. And that's where you get people like doing these books that I have right up here on the slide. You know, have you ever read anybody like Tao of Physics? Oh, wow. Anybody read Tao of Physics except for Brad, and that doesn't count, because I'm looking for people from your generation. Dancing Wooly Masters? Maybe, is there another important books out now that try to conflate these two things? Yeah, there must be, there must be other books. But, but basically, you had people that took this quantum physics, and Jung was the first one of them, because I know 
you know, you guys have probably heard of, you heard of synchronicity in the collective unconscious before this class, right? Yeah. All right, but synchronicity, all that. And you certainly heard, ooh, it's all coincidence. No, I mean, nothing, there's no such thing as coincidence. And people actually going, ooh, like that. You've heard that? Okay. So this, this is all packaged for people in a way that is very consilient with um, Eastern mysticism. We've all, you know that, right? When you go out into the world and you look at your yoga class schedule and the meditation, and you know that it's all Eastern philosophy, right? So we know that there's been a major sort of gang rush of Eastern mysticism into 20th century religious practices. How did it get there? It got there through modern physics. So this stuff all gets, I think I have time to explain this a little bit, but what? I don't know. Should I? I just, what if I lose them and they start walking out while I'm talking? Maybe we, maybe we should, well, I will just finish up with this. We're going to talk more about this on Tuesday, but how, why are we all now obsessed with Eastern mysticism? Because the Eastern mysticism expresses a fundamental uh, understanding of the universe that's in ways vaguely, metaphorically, extremely consistent with quantum physics. For instance, the Hindu term Maya, right? That means that the world is an illusion. Maya refers to this whole illusory state. When you look at Hindu notions of incarnation, right? Why do some people become Shudra and some people become Brahman? It's the refinement, the quality of your psychological energy that's left after you die actually embodies and shapes experience. So one thing we have in Eastern mysticism as opposed to you know, 19th century science is that mind shapes matter. Matter is absolutely not, uh, mind is not a construct of matter, but mind constructs matter. So with that spooky thought, mind not a construct of matter, mind constructs matter. That's a huge do -si do from the 19th century. That's a huge shift from Freud, right? That was all biological theory. You're all just neurons and axons and all this other stuff is just software you're running. Um, this is actually so profoundly supported by Eastern mysticism that we're going to find a cultural merging of the two things. And that's very exciting. We're going to talk about that on Tuesday. He is eating your food. <laughs> <laughs>